Another one of the big races that everybody is paying attention to in Hamilton this election is Ward 2. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There is a high profile challenger to the current incumbent. We're not even quite sure if there is going to be an incumbent because the incumbent, Jason Farr, decided to take a run in the provincial election in Stony Creek and lost. So is he coming back or not? So we don't really know how the race is going to shape up, but it's also a race that everyone in Hamilton is watching because it's downtown. And if you've been downtown in the last decade, you will see that there's a lot happening. A lot of really high stake projects are happening. And I think as the downtown goes, often as the heart of the city, it can affect the rest of the wards as well. So glad to have joining us on the program, Cameron Crutch. Thanks for having me, Lauren. Yeah, I'm happy to have thrown my hat in the ring. Well, you're one of the first people who came out of the gate in the new year. And with a video that last time I looked at it had had like over 40,000 views just on, I was watching it off of Twitter, something super high like that. Am I correct? Yeah, something like that. So that just shows me that there is a real appetite for the kind of candidacy that you've been bringing forward, you know, putting out a video early, this kind of enthusiasm, this kind of happy warrior vibe, you know, um, <laughs> and we, we've seen lots of that from you. But I wanted today to go through the platform which you just released today. And that platform has in it some really interesting comments from you. So if you could just tell our viewers right out of the gate, Cameron, what are the eight areas, I believe there's eight, of your platform just by name? And then I want to kind of unpack them with you and challenge maybe some of the some of the language you used. Sure thing. Um, the first one is environmental stewardship, uh, followed by affordable housing, accountable leadership, safe neighborhoods, a dependable transit, of course, community engagement, responsive services, and sustainable growth. You mentioned something in transportation where you say time's up like no more 10-year strategy uh and and given cameron what's happening with the two-way streets and another terrible car accident this past weekend mm. can you effectuate change faster than maybe the city had planned i think the reason i mentioned time's up it first of all harkens back to the the climate movement right uh, people have been calling on improvements to transit in our community. It was first a 10-year transit strategy, then it became the 11-year transit strategy. Um, we can't afford to wait to improve transit. We can't afford to wait to improve our streets in general. As you're alluding to, there have been um, more than a dozen pedestrian deaths in Hamilton. Um, we can't continue to sit by and allow that to happen. And we can't continue to sit and wait for report upon report upon report. Um, if it's a matter of providing resources to support climate and climate resiliency in Hamilton, we have to dedicate those re those resources. We can't say there's a climate emergency and then say we have to wait a year or wait two years or wait three years to get an answer. Um, right now, um, we're talking about turning Main Street to two ways, and that was a motion that was passed. And it's been, I think, maybe almost six or eight weeks, and we still don't have a sense of what those interventions are going to be. And I know the councillors should move that are working hard, and I know staff are working hard, um, but we're going to have to do things differently if we want to meet the challenges that are coming. There's huge challenges coming our way. Downtown is changing dramatically. and We can't continue to wait. We can't continue to do things the way we're doing them now. So is that realistic, though? I think we have to start by being proactive. We know change is coming. We've known for years, sometimes decades, that things are on the horizon. But some, for some reason, the city waits until the very last minute, um, waits until the, the very last uh, possibility, possible time to vote. Uh, and then there's a reaction and then staff begin to get to work. We saw that happen with LRT, the dithering back and forth over 13 years. We need to realize that there are best practices out there in the world, that Hamilton can do things. We can be a beautiful, wonderful, better city. And that means sometimes saying, okay, great, we've got the evidence we need, we have to move on this. It doesn't have to be the complete project completed right out of the gate. I get that, it's totally unrealistic. But what we have to do is say, what can we accomplish today? What can we know today? What can we communicate to residents today, right? And start with chunking those things. Because right now I know that there's a list sitting somewhere that would tell most residents what kinds of changes they'd look to be implementing on Main Street West, Main Street East. And people want to know what those are so we can start there and again this has been a conversation that's been on the table for a long time so i think a whole generation in the city talking about main street so there's no need for us to be waiting until the last possible moment until people have to lose their lives before we make a decision and before we act let's talk about affordable housing because you are right in the epicenter of development i mean the cranes are all over downtown there's condos popping up everywhere. they are yeah uh, how do you balance 
taking advantage of this moment of development and growth for our city that we've waited for decades for and still keep it equitable and inclusive as a city. We can't push Hamiltonians out. That's what I would say and that's what I've said. We can't push them out. We've seen change coming on the horizon for a long time now. Um, in the last five plus years, we've known about these cranes coming and now they're here. We've seen this over the decades in Hamilton. We saw it when they tore down a big section of the downtown uh, many decades ago. That change comes, that's a thing that happens. We're prepared for it. And that's not a bad thing, but how we manage that change matters. If we rush through this process and try and take advantage uh, of every second um, without really looking at the people who are impacted most, we're gonna leave them behind. There are 40,000 approximately people who live in downtown Hamilton. We cannot just simply steamroll through the downtown, change everything, tear the buildings down and go through that kind of process we went through before, which caused so much trauma to people. Things I still hear at the doorsteps today from people are talking about the kinds of loss um, that we've had of uh, buildings and public spaces and green spaces because we move too quickly. So for me, it's about making sure we manage that change, making sure we think carefully about things we do and making sure that we bring everybody along with us, right? There's nothing stopping us from making sure that everyone benefits from the change coming to Hamilton. And I will be focused on that. I will fight for that every day. Are you anti-development? Absolutely not. We have to build if we're going to meet our sprawl goals, for instance, right? Um, I can't be someone who's sitting here talking about stopping sprawl and building inside the urban boundary, but also saying, well, we're not going to build anything. I think there's a, a lot of potential for a ton of mixed development in the downtown core. This city right now is sitting on a third of a thousand acres of unused land. A hundred acres or 200 acres of that would have an incredible impact on a gentle, density, a missing middle kind of housing, and allow us to combine that with splitting houses up into duplexes and triplexes and quads, um, building some high rise housing in locations where it makes sense, having that mix, making sure we have all kinds of housing at all kinds of affordability levels from the deep affordability to market affordability. And the city can play a role in that. We keep doing this thing where we say, well, we'll talk to the province, we'll talk to the federal government about it and see if they'll help us solve this problem. Cool, they probably will help us solve the problem, but we're gonna to have to come to the table with a plan. What are our assets? What do we have right now? The answer pretty, you know, pretty uniformly is we have some land. We can either sell that land off that we'll never get back, or we can leverage those assets, leverage that land to build housing and to develop. And so we need people out there in the trades. We need people building. We need developers to plan these things. That's a necessary part of what's happening in our city and especially downtown. What happens when the tents come up this summer, Cameron? Uh, more and more of them, I, I imagine. Well, a couple of things come to mind. One, I go back to what I said earlier about affordable housing and about making sure our land assets are being used appropriately, making sure we're looking at what we have as resources as a city to be able to help with this problem. And firstly, I think it's about compassion. Um, right now, people are running scared. Um, there's no better way to put it. They're, they've left the places that they were hanging out normally, where they felt safe, um, where they were living, um, and they've gone off into places which are more remote, harder to access. I've personally been out there up the Escarpment Rail Trail, seen and spoken to folks, and the concerns are real for them, um, especially if they've got an injury or they have a disability and they're having trouble getting around, um, things are a lot more precarious for them in that spot. What if they need treatment or help? How does someone get to them? How do volunteers help them? So having people pushed out of these spaces into areas where um, they don't have the support they need isn't helping anybody. When I've spoken to Hamiltonians at the door, especially down in Ward 2, a lot we knocked all through June, consistently what I hear from people is the same thing over and over and over again. They want to see a solution. They feel compassionate. They want to understand what the city is going to do to take care of people, and they don't want to see them chased from park to park. They don't want to see their belongings scrapped and put in the back of a truck, right? They don't think about this as a game. They think about this as people's lives, and they care deeply about it. Um, I have only pretty much heard that um, when knocking on doors. A couple of times people raise concerns, and the more we speak about the root causes of affordable housing, the more they agree that that's where we have to start. This is not about tent encampments. This is about affordable housing. And 
There's lots of blame to go around for why we're here. 20 years of not investing in housing, 20 years of letting the market um, take over and 20 years of watching buildings crumble has put us where we are. Nothing was more heartbreaking than watching people living in tents across from the Jamesville development, which was fenced off and closed for three or four years, just sitting there idle. And there may be good reasons for why that happens, but we can't, the disparity is jarring when we look at that. Um, there has to be more we can do. I know there's more we can do because I know we have lands to our disposal that we can use. I know that we see groups like Inwell, Kiwanis, continually coming up with creative solutions to these problems, continually finding ways to do it. If these organizations can do that with way less money and way less assets, what is our excuse? What is our excuse for not leveraging all the all that we have to try and make sure we're leveling the playing field, making sure there's housing for everybody at no matter what your income level is. Downtown is often a test to the vitality of an entire community. So how do you balance your own feelings around environmental stewardship and around transportation priorities and around equitable um, development with the needs for the broader city? I think you're right. Uh, by saying that the downtown is something focused on by many people. We have a lot of huge city assets here. This is where people come to enjoy watching sports a lot of the time. It's where people come to enjoy the waterfront area, right? It's where people come often to experience that downtown vibe, to be out in restaurants and doing that kind of thing. So people have their eye on downtown, right? And people are coming here sometimes for single purpose and leaving. What I'm focused on too is balancing that between the folks that are coming here to enjoy the downtown and enjoy the assets that are down here and the people who live here day in and day out. Nothing is uh, more poignant, I think, than the kind of cut through traffic we have from trucks on some of our local neighborhoods. And the council did a good thing um, with the truck route reboot people really pushing hard uh, on them to sort of rein that in a bit. Um, and that was a really great example of, first of all, neighborhood engagement and, and listening to people who live here. Um, but it was also, um, an important iconic moment because what we saw was, okay, there's an acknowledgement, a wider acknowledgement that yes, these, these trucks are having an impact on neighborhoods and yes, um, communities are being impacted. And I think that when we look out to the larger, larger city of Hamilton, I hope that every single councillor sitting around the horseshoe kind of takes a hint or a note from the tone we saw in this term of council and see how much residents don't like it when people start identifying a ward with themselves. I've been at so many council meetings, I've seen tweets where councillors refer to the area where the residents they represent live as their ward or my ward. I think it's a really toxic mentality and I think it spills out not only um, on the council table but out to the community too, right? Where people are going around um, acting as if they're the uh, fife leader of the, of the ward they're in. All the stuff we're seeing swirling around Terry Whitehead and all the dysfunction we're seeing and all the toxic stuff going on at council. What are you gonna do differently? A couple things. I wanna expand the hours that we operate um, that means, of course, expanding our office staff to accommodate that. Be available for people. Um, they want to reach us on a weekend um, or an evening. Uh, and also the methods in which they communicate. If they want to reach us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, they can do that, right? The ability to connect in a way that's accessible for them. So firstly, it's about the methods and about expanding some of this. But it's also about speaking out in public when things are happening, right? So just as much as I wanna receive feedback from residents that way in as many forms as possible, as accessibly as possible, I have to be doing the same thing, right, outwardly. So I have to have more town halls and regular communications and I can use those same tools to do that. And so that's an effective piece. Also speaking publicly about things, I think outside of the council chamber. I think a lot of councillors use that chamber as a way to communicate. And I think that what we're learning over time is sure, people are definitely tuning into the live streams and sure people are sharing clips, but people aren't typically sitting there watching the entire meeting for eight hours, sometimes nine hours or overnight. That council table is not always an effective way to communicate your values, communicate your ideas and communicate your updates. So we have to broaden that out. We have to be present. And I think I've done that for the last four years. I've been downtown, I've been at things, I've been events, communicating with people. And so I think that's what I'm gonna to continue to do as a counselor is be present in my neighborhood, be present in my community, show up. What's to keep you from doing what we've seen too many counselors do, which is just kind of glob into this culture or the Borg of city council and say, you know what, we're of one mind. We're not gonna share anymore. We're not gonna take media interviews. We're not going to communicate. We're gonna lock down and it'll be us versus them. I mean, how are you gonna make sure that doesn't freaking happen again? 
<laughs> well, first, I mean, I'm going to work with my colleagues and I'm going to take staff's advice. Um, those things are important to making sure we can make those citywide decisions. At the same time, I think everyone knows this, I've been pretty outspoken. If I'm elected, I'm elected to serve the residents of Ward 2 and I have a responsibility to serve the residents of Hamilton. If something happens, like a Coots Paradise spill, like we saw that cover up and scandal, like the Red Hill Valley Parkway, I hope residents know, based on my track record, that I will stand up and I will say something and I'm willing to face the consequences of that because at the end of the day, we have to make sure that the residents that elect us, that put us in those chairs, are the ones that hold us accountable. And that's why I'm out there making sure that the people I'm accountable to are people in my community, people in my neighborhood, people in Ward 2, and people who are out there doing the same kinds of things, fighting for social justice. I'm not accountable to other people. I'm accountable to them. And I'm going to make sure that I serve them for the entire four years I'm in office. Then what happens, and I have to play this, I have to play this out with you because I get sure. to talk to yeah, a lot by of all counselors, means. right? And, and there's something that happens once they get in there where it's like if they want to achieve the things for their residents, their priorities, their accountability to their residents, they have to horse straight. Well, a couple things about that. I think firstly, we're seeing there's going to be quite a bit of change on council. So the status quo we've been used to up to now where um, we've seen a lot of horse trading as just the status quo for politics, what goes on behind the scenes. Um, I think we're going to see a shift. Um, I don't know how much of a shift that will be. I can't speak to what exactly that will look like, but we've already seen councillors stepping down. And we know there's going to be some tough races ahead. And I think it's going to see quite a bit of change on council, maybe even a majority of change. So this is an opportunity to usher in a new era on city council, a new era for the city. And I think that's the first thing that I want to say about how we might respond to and do things differently when we're there. But of course, there are going to be compromises. And I'm not a past compromising. That's totally OK. Um, but I think what we're going to have to do as a, as a council is, is understand that um, each one of us has both a priority to the residents, but a collective responsibility to the whole city. Um, we can't be treating these things um, like they only matter in our neighborhood, that they only have an impact where we are, or that it's our award, right? We have to start turning our minds outward and having conversations. And I think by inviting Hamiltonians into that conversation, by engaging with Hamiltonians, not only will I be holding my council colleagues accountable, things like that, but so will they, right? And that's what we've seen Hamiltonians step up and do is they've said, look, this is an important issue to us. We want to hear about this. And they're going to show up and they're going to hold everyone at the council table accountable. For sure, there are some things I'm just not going to be able to talk about because they're either legally impossible to talk about or because it doesn't make sense to talk about them right away. And I get that and I respect that that's going to happen from time to time. But where I can, I'll be getting out there making stuff known, and I certainly won't be um, quiet if there's an issue that's impacting people in my neighborhood, people in our community, and people across one the country. One of the things I liked about your platform, the way you wrote it, is that you had the why in every statement, right? And I've often said to counselors, just tell us why you can't tell us, and we will respect that, you know, providing that you're not abusing the in-camera privilege. Um, which Hamilton Council has done, uh, but not telling us anything, not responding to phone calls, burying your head in the sand, not making statements on public things that happen, uh, waiting for, I guess, the mayor to do it who never was doing it. And Fred's gone now, so in the past, uh, you know, hopefully going forward, we'll have a mayor that speaks on behalf of council. But if the mayor doesn't, whoever the mayor ends up being, Cameron, and there's something like a violent attack at Pride, or there's something like these, these terrible things happening with our streets, or something else happens where citizens are begging for leadership, would you be the kind of candidate that would issue a statement? I will absolutely speak out. Okay. The minimum requirement seems to be right now absolute silence. When you look on an agenda and you see an item is marked down for a camera, it often just gives a very vague title. I'm going to be advocating that we actually put descriptions down there that tell people what the issue is. There's always this presence or notion or idea that something is in camera or something is confidential and that we can't share it. And there's this cloud cast over the entire issue. But as you get into issues and as I have, um, and I've put FOI requests and other things in, um, you find out that actually parts of the information can be shared. So I'm gonna be advocating to make sure that as much information as possible becomes transparent. And if other members on council don't want to reveal these kinds of things to the public, things that could impact their health and their well-being, know that I will definitely speak up and I'm prepared for the consequences of that. We cannot have another situation where we're having members of our community going into water where there's contamination and holding our tongue because a lawyer says we should. That's people's health, people's safety at risk. And I'm not going to put that at risk. I'm not going to put Hamiltonians at risk.
You say in one of your platform areas about the service delivery quality that you're going to provide. And you say good enough isn't good enough and that your team is going to provide excellent service and that Hamiltonians pay for and deserve excellent services across the city. Uh, and that you will report on things and you will keep them accountable. And that sounds amazing. However, aren't you setting the bar so high that you are just asking for a, a ton of criticism the second that you guys drop a phone call or you know publish something with a typo in it? <laughs> excellent service doesn't mean perfection, right? To me, excellent service means meeting people where they're at making sure you're providing as many services as you can and continuing to advocate for what you can't. You know, if you're wrong, you make a mistake, you apologize, you have some humanity about that. We're all gonna make mistakes on this job. I'm gonna make mistakes on this job. But excellence doesn't have to be about perfection. I think it really has to be about focusing on the needs of the people around you and making sure you deliver those. And as someone who has been in this community, who has been listening to people for years and years um, and who is understanding the things they have problems with, the things they wish could be better. I think I have an understanding of what that excellence looks like, right? And sometimes it's just reaching out a helping hand. Sometimes it's just listening, or sometimes it's just being available, um, you know, past four o'clock on a Friday, or being available, um, having staff be available on a Sunday to, to listen to someone's concern and get back to them about their issue. Um, a lot of concerns residents reach out with are, are sometimes easily solved. There's complicated stuff that happens, um, but sometimes it's just a matter of not being able to find a resource. Um, so I'm committed to making sure we do an awesome hiring search, get some people in there who really want to engage with residents, because I think it doesn't stop at the phone call they give you. It's got to be you going out knocking on doors, you making phone calls, and you continuing to engage with residents to, to make sure they get the service they deserve. So last, any last thoughts, any last message you want to communicate? Is there a website where people who are watching this can find out more about your platform? Yeah, my platform's up right now at cameronforward2.ca slash platform. Um, all eight priorities are there and we have about 70 policy items. You can read them in detail. Anyone has questions about it, they can reach out to me. I want people to know that we can have a better city. I think so many of our leaders have shown us or told us that um, the city we have right now, some of the services we get right now are what we deserve. Um, they're, the status quo is, is good enough and it's not good enough. Um, we deserve to have a city that's as good as any other place. That's the best city in Ontario. And all we have to do, I think, is harness that power of working together with a new council, dream a bit bigger and make it happen. I love it. I love the dream a bit bigger. <laughs> you know, we have so much potential. Uh, and just listening to you running for the downtown ward, so much of that potential might be coming through you as the councillor. And uh, so thank you for giving us a very nuanced and honest take on how you see your role as that downtown councillor and what you think the priorities are going forward for both your ward and for all of the residents of Hamilton. And if you've been enjoying this content, uh, subscribe on YouTube, we'll keep getting it to you. And most importantly, vote, bring a friend, talk to your family. We need to have big voter turnout on October 24th, the only way that we guarantee we can have the kind of changes that we all want and that we're all talking about. Cameron Kretsch, uh, thank you so much for being on The O Show and for being always, even before you were a candidate, one of the voices that people trust on the issues that they care about. Thanks for doing the program. Thanks, Laura.